from Central Bank of Ireland and welcome to the fourth session of the conference, Monetary Policy Transmission Through Non-Banks. Uh, the first paper will be presented by Ruggero Iappelli from uh, Goethe University Frankfurt, Quantitative Easing, the Repo Market and the Term Structure of Interest Rates. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Loriana Pelizzon and uh, Marti Subramaniam. And uh, uh, in the paper, we are interested in the effects of uh, monetary policy on both the yield curve as well as uh, the market for securitized uh, financing. So particularly the repo market. And now, there is a strong evidence that quantitative easing, both in the euro area and in the US, um, have clearly impacted the, the term structure of interest rates as well as the repo rates. So central banks bought a lot of bonds and therefore they reduced the quantity of bonds that uh, was available to market participants in order to cover their outstanding short selling positions. And in doing so, uh, have induced scarcity of high quality collateral, which have therefore, uh, has therefore resulted into um, high levels of repo specialness. So previous studies, so those are by the way, uh, strongly documented empirical patterns have been considered uh, in isolations. In this paper, uh, we, we think of them in combination with each other. And so particularly we are going to consider bonds not only as uh, investment opportunities, but also as collateral for overnight uh, repo transactions. So in doing so, we are building on uh, uh, literature uh, on the effects of the uh, quantitative easing on the term structure of interest rates, more generally quantitative policies, and uh, particularly um, we are going to build on the framework by uh, Vajanos and Villa, and uh, we are also building on uh, uh, literature that considers another market, market for uh, repo rates. I don't think I need to uh, convince this audience that uh, uh, repo markets are actually the lifeblood of economic activities. So, uh, activity. so therefore, you know, they're quite large, they're important, and there is a clear understanding that demand pressures um, affect uh, repo rates, particularly uh, in the context of quantitative easing. Now, the problem, so why are standard theories uh, um, not able to, to deal with this evidence? Uh, in standard models of the term structure, we are used to assume that the short rate is unique, typically follows some exogenously specified uh, stochastic process, and it's therefore exogenous to the quantities of bonds that are uh, purchased by the central banks. So in this paper, we are going to develop a framework that is going to help us to think very clearly about the interactions of bond and repo markets along the yield curve. So just to um, cast our paper against the backdrop of the existing literature, uh, existing literature. so typically the bond market is uh, uh, represented through a yield curve that plots the, uh, the, the duration of a bond against the yield of a bond. And that uh, the very short end of the term structure, there is a, a, an overnight uh, market for the short rate, uh, which is uh, akin uh, in those models to a general collateral rate. Uh, general collateral rate, uh, it's a, a rate that is uh, used to uh, collateralize uh, repo transactions. Now we are going to leverage Think of, for example, the uh, secured overnight financing rate. That is what uh, uh, most, uh, uh, most of you have in mind when thinking about uh, uh, term structure models. We are going to leverage a, a friction of the repo market uh, that is uh, its segmentation. So on the one hand, we have the so-called cash-driven transactions for general collateral, whereby market participants use bonds in order to collateralize their uh, securitized loans. On the other hand, some transactions are so-called um, security-driven transactions. Uh, uh, particularly, why so? Because market participants uh, are willing to forego some of their returns in order to borrow the bond. So they really need the specific bond. 
and uh, they are willing to forego some of the returns uh, um, in order to uh, get this bond. And particularly, they might be interested in this bond in order to meet pending short selling commitments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So just to uh, motivate it against the empirical evidence, we know that there is an entire cross-section of money market rates. Um, the black solid line over here shows the interest rate on the general collateral bonds. On the other hand, um, I'm also, uh, we are also plotting um, the rate that applies to special collateral bonds, uh, German bonds, uh, for different uh, uh, um, time to maturity of the bond. And uh, as you can see from this chart, uh, there is an entire cross-section of money market rates, and particularly the repo specialness uh, corresponds to the vertical distance between the general collateral interest rate and the special collateral interest rate. Okay, so for example, um, if I had a 10-year uh, German Bund um, during the sample considered, I would have been able to uh, obtain financing at cheaper conditions. Why so? Because uh, the Bund was uh, in, in high demand, uh, perhaps because the uh, quantity of collateral that was available in financial markets uh, um, was shrinking uh, also um, in particular in a way that is connected to um, uh, large-scale asset purchases by uh, central banks. And in order to uh, complement it with a little bit of uh, um, empirical evidence coming from the, the BIS, uh, I'm showing uh, European specialness spreads just to um, comment on the magnitude. And uh, as we can see, it's quite large. So particularly peaking at about 5.5 uh, percentage points uh, at times where interest rates were negative. So the magnitude of special repo rates in the Eurozone, I don't think I need to convince you, was quite large. And uh, here uh, we have the share of, of uh, uh, special volume for Germany that peaks at about 80% of collateral on special uh, until coming down gradually after the introduction of the securities lending facility by the European Central Bank. Uh, that enabled market participants to borrow the, uh, the, uh, the, the bond against cash. So our results, uh, um, our contribution, if you will, is to uh, develop a, a first attempt of a quantity-driven term structure model uh, which endogenizes the money market. So why do we care? We find uh, in, in the paper that triple specialness uh, um, strengthens the lo local supply effects of quantitative easing relative price anomalies between bonds that have um, similar duration risk, and dampens the duration extraction channel of QE, which is the primarily intended, in, intended goal of quantitative easing to flatten the yield curve. So um, this is basically saying that dysfunctional money markets uh, impair the transmission of quantitative easing to term premium. Well, how do we get to these conclusions? Um, let me uh, show you a little bit, let me bring out a little bit of the flavor of the model. Um, it's a model for uh, riskless zero coupon bonds uh, that are indexed by their tenure, tau, and uh, a status uh, that is equal to general as opposed to special collateral. So particularly um, general and special collateral uh, bonds have totally equivalent cash flows, but their price might differ as a result of uh, demand effects. So here, uh, the definition of the yield to maturity, it's quite standard. It relates the yield to the, the log of the price of the bond, and there is an exogenously specified uh, short rate. So that's a very classical setup. Okay? How do we think about the entire cross-section of money market rates in this context? we are going to solve for special repo rates endogenously. In order to do so, we are building on the preferred habitat view of the term structure, um, from which we actually depart by assuming that bonds are, uh, there is a segmented demand for the bonds. So there are some bonds that are on special, that are targeted by preferred habitat investors. Those are special bonds, and there are some bonds that are for example, bonds that are ineligible for QE that are not directly targeted by, uh, by uh, preferred habitat investors. Okay, so it's a very simple structure. The demand uh, has an elasticity, alpha to the log of price, and uh, has an intercept that can be used, for example, to think of quantitative easing. Uh, 
um, arbitrageurs are going to connect prices over uh, uh, habitat segments. So particularly, they're going to smooth out price differences uh, uh, that are not uh, compensated by risk. Therefore, markets need to clear in equilibrium. And uh, uh, they are taking the opposite side, so we think of the private sector, of taking the opposite side of the central bank. They solve a mean variance problem that is uh, um, outlined here. And uh, what is particularly interesting about those arbitrageurs uh, is that uh, uh, in order to short sell a bond that they do not own, they first need to reverse the bond on the repo market. Then they are going to sell the bond outright. And then they need to deliver the bond back in the repo market uh, at termination of the repo agreement. So if you will, arbitrageurs are the uh, modeling device in order to connect the bond and the money market, among which we know there exists a strong no arbitrage uh, relationship. So we guess uh, that uh, the price uh, is uh, affine in the short rate and conditionally on demand pressure, it's also affine in, um, uh, conditionally on the status, uh, I'm sorry, it's also affine in the demand pressure. What does it mean? It means that bonds that are directly targeted by QE respond, for example, QE eligible bonds respond directly to prices. As a result of demand pressure, bonds uh, that have uh, equivalent cash flows may, diff may trade uh, at different prices. And uh, if you just uh, uh, replace this equation over here, uh, you can see very clearly that rearranging terms, uh, uh, this expression can be rephrased a little bit more compactly with the use uh, of a dummy variable that is equal to one if the bond is on special and zero uh, otherwise. Coming to the equilibrium, um, well, we have equilibrium in two markets. So first, let me describe the equilibrium in the bond market. Um, and as you are familiar with, the equilibrium requires uh, the, the optimality in terms of the trade-off between risk and return. So uh, in the equation above, as you can see, the uh, excess return of a position over and above the repo rate must, equal, must be equal to the compensation for duration, this AI over here, times the market price of short rate risk. Okay, so here comes our first uh, important contribution. Uh, since uh, the expected returns of the bond is uh, uh, allowed to be bond specific, and the standard deviation of the bond is allowed to be bond specific, well, why don't we also have a short rate that is uh, enabled to vary in the cross-section? So we also generalize uh, a classical definition of share ratio in order to have a risk-free rate that responds endogenously to quantities. One other thing that I would like to highlight about this equation is that uh, it uh, jointly describes both the general term structure of interest rate uh, as well as the term structure of special, uh, of special bonds, uh, as you can see from the index I. Now, another important thing uh, is about uh, the duration extraction channel. So the market price of risk in this uh, class of models, uh, preferred habitat models, uh, it's tied to the demand of preferred habitat investors. So particularly the holdings of arbitrageurs are going to influence how much they are willing to bear interest rate risk. And here, as you can see, the compensation for risk that is common to both general and special collateral bonds reflects the holdings both of general as well as of uh, special collateral bonds, ensuring the transmission of quantitative easing to bonds that are not directly eligible for asset purchases. So when the duration risk of arbitrageurs goes down, the premium for shorting long bonds, remember that arbitrageurs take the opposite side of the um, preferred habitat investors, uh, the, the risk premium goes down and therefore the term premium also goes down. Uh, so what's going on is a, a duration extraction channel. So when the central bank buys a lot of bonds, it reduces the duration that is held in the portfolio of the private sector and compresses uh, uh, the compensation required for risk. And in doing so, the term premium. Now, another market that we consider very carefully is the repo market. So in the repo market, uh, uh, first uh, uh, on the axis, you are seeing repo specialness. Uh, if you recall the vertical distance between uh, special and general collateral interest rates and the quantity of uh, specific collateral on the uh, x-axis. 
And uh, the demand for, uh, um, for special collateral that is exerted by arbitrageurs, it's completely inelastic. So why so? Because arbitrageurs uh, have entered the commitment to deliver the bond uh, on the buyback date of uh, the repo contract. So therefore, they need, come what may, to borrow the bond in order to uh, close the repo transaction. We also assume that uh, the supply, as it, uh, it is consistent uh, with the data and with the approach, for example, of uh, Duffy, uh, the supply is uh, upward sloping, reflecting structural frictions in the repo market. That is fairly intuitive. The size of the issue, it's, uh, uh, um, it's uh, bound. So therefore, in order to supply incremental units of the bond, market participants will require higher premium in, in, uh, in terms of repo specialness. So, crucially, the equilibrium is going to depend on uh, how preferred habitat investors uh, are going to um, behave in the repo market. So there are two scenarios that we consider. So the first, uh, over here, uh, preferred habitat investors are not lending their bonds on the repo market. In doing so, they have effectively generated an excess demand for the bond in the repo market that they are not willing to meet um, uh, offsetting the excess demand with the supply of those bonds. On the other hand, securities lending facility is shifting in parallel both the demand and the supply, and therefore it's able to uh, reduce the level of specialness. Why so? Because the central bank is uh, willing to take the opposite side of the arbitrageurs, not only on the bond market, but also on the repo market. Bond prices and repo rates, uh, as, we, as, as we know, are connected uh, by the following relationship. So the price is equal to the expectations of the discounted stream of, uh, uh, of interest rates in the future. And therefore, the price premium of special bonds, it's related to the present discounted value of the specialness going forward. Now, in the last uh, um, 10 minutes or so, I would like to characterize the equilibrium and uh, uh, its dividends. So particularly, uh, first, uh, as a benchmark, uh, let us consider a general equilibrium in the absence of securities lending facility. This corresponds uh, to the Vianos and Villa model uh, that is published in Econometrica that uh, you know very well, where there is a unique short rate and uh, uh, the coefficient b is, is uh, constrained to be equal to zero. So therefore, there are no price differences between bonds that have equivalent cash flows. Now, if we actually generalize uh, this concept to a two market, uh, uh, to a two market uh, uh, economy, we also consider and generate an entire cross-section of repo rates that uh, responds to the quantities that are um, that are bought by the central bank or by preferred habitat investors and that are not uh, lent on the money market. As a reflection, bond prices uh, um, are going to have different, uh, uh, bond prices are going to be different for bonds that have equivalent uh, cash flows in proportion to uh, the elasticity of supply of collateral in the repo market that reflects uh, structural frictions. So for example, how much uh, pension funds and insurance companies uh, are willing to lend their bonds against uh, incremental repo specialness premium. So just to characterize the predictions of, uh, of the model uh, that are generated, think of uh, conventional monetary policy. Now, there is a, a growing uh, uh, evidence that repo specialness impairs the transmission of rate hikes uh, to, to the bond and to the money market. What does it mean? That when the central bank hikes its rate, special collateral responds by a little bit less. So it's less responsive, and also the price of special bonds are less responsive to rate hikes. That is, uh, in principle, not very easy to, to, to understand. Why wouldn't they just uh, shift uh, in parallel? Now, in our framework, that is uh, uh, quite naturally generated by the model because uh, special collateral interest rates respond not one-to-one -to, -one to, uh, to duration risk. And why so? When the central bank hikes its rate, the price of the special bond goes down, and therefore the demand of preferred habitat investors increase, also increasing its specialness. So it responds by less than one-to-one -to, -one to conventional monetary policy. 
not only in the money market. So um, we are not only treating special collateral repo rates in the overnight repo market, but also special bonds have a comparatively lower duration risk. And so therefore they, um, they respond less uh, along the yield curve to changes in the interest rate. Coming to quantitative easing, repo specialness uh, we show in the paper dampens the effect of QE on the term premium. That is uh, um, uh, fairly intuitive, if you will. Why so? Because specialness uh, is uh, shrinking the holdings of the arbitrageurs. If the bond is now costly to borrow, arbitrageurs are going to be willing to borrow less of the bond, and therefore the, uh, the extent to which the central bank is able to compress the duration of the portfolio of the private sector endogenously responds to uh, the degree to which uh, the central bank is willing to lend the bond in, uh, in the money market. Okay. So quantitative easing is more effective when money markets are more functional. So there is no repo specialness. And that is uh, fairly intuitive because uh, when specialness rises, ultimately repo specialness uh, it's nothing but uh, a limit to arbitrage. So therefore it discourages the activity of short selling. But uh, what does short selling do to the duration of the portfolio of arbitrageurs? Well, short sellers are short the long bond and uh, long the sequence of overnight repo rates. So short selling is an activity that has a negative duration. And therefore, if we limit short selling in the system, we are also increasing the duration in the, that is uh, held by private investors. And therefore, um, overall, there is an effect on the term premium that goes in the opposite direction of what is uh, um, most of the times the main objective of QE, that is the one of compressing and flattening the yield curve. The first order condition of arbitrageurs, uh, it's, uh, it's able to, um, to highlight a very um, interesting trade-off between that is inherent in quantitative policies. So both uh, quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. That is uh, uh, repo specialness for uh, a given level of the interest rate is generating stronger uh, local supply effects and a weaker duration extraction channel of QE, which results into a steeper yield curve. So that is fairly intuitive. So consider what happens if uh, repo specialness uh, increases. For a given level of interest rates, think of an economy that is at uh, the zero lower bound. So two things can occur. Either the um, returns from short selling a bond must increase relative to the duration risk of the position, so mu relative to the A, the duration risk, that is entirely localized as a, as a supply effect. Okay? So this means, for example, the bond goes a lot on special, and that's entirely reflected in the price of the bond. At the opposite end of the spectrum, we have a transmission to the entire yield curve. So that results into a complete transmission into the market price of risk that steepens the entire yield curve. Now, this effect can be used by policymakers. So, for example, our paper uh, would also recommend to, to policymakers that, for example, if the main objective is the one to compress the yield curve, then the bond should be lent out in the repo market. On the other hand, there are certain instances in which policymakers might be interested in uh, generating local supply effects. For example, it was uh, in the debate uh, the idea of uh, buying uh, corporate green bonds. Um, and uh, well, if the transmission is uh, uh, perfect uh, along the uh, bonds that have equivalent cash flows, that's not going to ease the cost of financing for those corporations. On the other hand, if those bonds are not lent on the repo market, then a strong local supply effect is going to be generated by, and therefore, uh, it, it has a high potential into uh, resulting into um, real effects for, for green firms and uh, uh, economic activity. So this trade-off, uh, it's, it's a very general concept uh, that applies both to quantitative easing as well as to tightening policies. 
Now, to illustrate uh, the mechanisms uh, of the model, uh, uh, I'm going to present a, a qualitative uh, calibration that uh, uh, shows uh, uh, and brings out a little bit of the flavor of the model. So particularly, um, we model two term structure of interest rates, the one of general collateral bonds, that is, uh, for example, the one that is typically uh, bootstrapped from, from derivatives, and a, a special uh, term structure of interest rates, that is the one that is directly affected by central bank quantitative uh, easing operations. Now, um, we can only do that by considering a, a repo market that is therefore dual to the cash market, uh, whereby rates of special uh, bonds are comparatively lower, therefore preventing arbitrage opportunities from being executable. Now, we also uh, assume that there is a stronger uh, level of uh, uh, local supply effects for, for the 10-year bonds, just to, just to um, show how does it look like, uh, local, how do look, uh, local supply effects look like in our model. And uh, our model generates strongly localized uh, supply effects uh, that are um, in line with what we uh, observe uh, in the data. For example, for, um, that are typical of financial markets, for example, uh, for cheapest to deliver bonds or um, for, 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 uh, for green bonds or particularly for large scale asset purchases. So the, the, the punchline of the slide is that uh, repo specialness strengthens the local supply channel of quantitative easing, which is fairly intuitive. One other thing that uh, uh, this uh, calibration uh, enables us to understand uh, is uh, why uh, policymakers uh, would uh, smooth their interventions uh, across, uh, um, across over time. So basically uh, in doing repeated uh, in interventions. Why so? Because uh, the repo market reflects the quantity of collateral that is available uh, uh, on the market. And on the other hand, uh, uh, bond uh, prices are forward-looking expectations of future uh, interest rates going forward. So one other thing that uh, uh, we would like to highlight uh, using this only qualitative uh, calibration is that uh, the um, effects of uh, quantitative easing on the term premium crucially depends on the, uh, depend on the conditions in uh, the, the money market. So particularly, uh, we start uh, an economy from the zero lower bound and we uh, consider what would happen uh, if the central bank were, uh, willing to, was willing to compress the yield curve. Uh, so we have a scenario in which the term premium um, goes down from 0 0.39 to 0 0.24, but uh, uh, the repo market is not, uh, uh, so money markets are not uh, uh, responding to uh, asset purchases. On the other hand, we also consider a situation in which the repo market uh, endogenously responds so that QE creates uh, repo specialness, as it, as it is well documented in the empirical literature. Now, the term premium goes down by a little bit less, and it goes down by uh, a lot more less if we consider uh, uh, an even more upward sloping supply curve of repo collateral. So in conclusion, in this paper, we have developed a new framework to, uh, that, would, um, that will help us to think about uh, uh, the term structure and the money market that uh, I would argue is intuitive. So bond scarcity um, increases local supply effects and uh, dampens the duration extraction channel of QE, therefore um, constituting actually a threat to the, uh, to the um, primarily intended goal of quantitative easing of uh, flattening the yield curve. Moreover, the framework is uh, uh, quite realistic, uh, where specialness uh, arises uh, endogenously and increases in the short selling behavior of uh, arbitrageurs. Uh, the framework is uh, tractable in admitting solutions in, in close form and therefore enabling us to perform uh, counterfactual uh, analysis. And it generates uh, a rich set of uh, uh, policy implications, whereby monetary policy on the yield curve should always, uh, we think, be uh, considered in combination with monetary policy on the overnight uh, repo markets. Another interesting uh, implication 
for policymakers of, uh, of our paper before I conclude is that uh, uh, they might want to induce long-term investors, uh, uh, such as, for example, uh, pension funds and insurance companies to uh, lend their bonds on the repo market uh, in order to increase uh, the availability of uh, high quality uh, collateral. And uh, with that said, uh, I would like to thank you and uh, make room for uh, 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 the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ruggiero, for the presentation. And Rafet will discuss the paper. Thanks. Thank you. Hey. Um, it's customary to thank organizers for the opportunity to discuss a paper and recommend that the audience read the paper. In this case, I will genuinely thank the organizers and tell you that you really should. And in fact, um, you know, if you were looking at your cell phone or your laptop while the presentation was going on, you missed out. This is an awesome paper. It really is important and you should know it. The big question here is, you know, why on earth QE is working, okay? It, it really goes back to that. And in particular, it relates to a whole bunch of deep, deep questions in macrofinance in a coherent, consistent, tractable way. Um, I have to tell you, I mean, this paper, it really is awesome. It's not easy reading, it's not bedtime reading. I tried and failed. Um, but it's well worth reading. If you're interested in macrofinance, you really have to read this. If you're a policymaker thinking about QE or QT, you really have to read this. It relates to um, some age-old questions in a way, I, I really was impressed. Um, you know, some of these questions I had thought about, but I hadn't been able to articulate the questions as cleanly as done in this paper, let alone coming up with an answer to them. Okay. Um, so it, it really is, you know, th that rare paper that makes you say, I am very glad somebody took the time to think about this and write it up this way, right? Um, I only have very good things to say about it. In, in general, I like to whine in my, you know, uh, discussions and say, ah, you know, uh, I would have done it this other way. I don't think I'd be able to do this, actually. Um, and um, if I were, certainly not uh, surpass this. Okay. So... Um, So now we have three issues in macrofinance that um, you know, come and bite us um, every time we try to think about the term structure. One is the overall upper slope of the term structure, right? Because you look at this and say, it can't be that people expect interest rates to go up all the time. So there has to be something going on there, right? The second one is when you're looking at the movements of the term structure in, the, in a principal components way, the level overwhelmingly dominates. So the two ends of the yield curve move in the same direction. Okay? And our macro models really hate this, right? because our macro models say, you know, whatever happens today is going to die out soon, so the long end shouldn't be moving around. The macro model says the dominant factor has to be slope. And the yield curve says, well, it ain't. And we need to find a way of squaring these. And the third one is the question about supply effects. Okay? And this has many guises in things like, you know, if the treasury needs to borrow a lot and dumps a ton of securities on the market, will this have a price effect? Or if the central bank is withdrawing a ton of securities from the market in, in, in the you know, form of QE, will this have an effect? And this paper talks about the supply curve being upward sloping because it's a finance paper. If you're a macro guy, you're going to think about the demand curve being downward sloping because these are all related to the macrofinance researcher's bane of existence, consumption capem. Consumption capem is something that comes bundled in our standard macro models. Unless you do something to get rid of it, the moment you write down a consumption function, not a consumption, a utility function, right, it implies a marginal utility that marginal utility prices everything, including securities. And that price, that price internal, leaves no room for supply effects because it creates a flat demand curve, okay? Now, this we understand. So conceptually, QE shouldn't work because, you know, central bank is buying securities, selling securities. Who cares? As long as the marginal utilities are the same, pricing is going to be the same. Now, this was a big deal, and this, this is exactly why Vianos Villa is such a rightly celebrated paper, 
because that's the one that went back to 1950s and said, well, you know, we had the toolkit to think about these supply effects, the downward sloping demand curve, right? But it was done in the 1950s fashion, so not sufficiently arbitrage free, not sufficiently, you know, chichi the way we want to do things now. But we can take that idea and put it into a framework that makes sense to us now, right? Okay. The issue with Wynospila is it, it's predicated on the idea that, yeah, you know, there are some people who like long-term stuff, some people who like short-term stuff. They don't talk to each other. Our treasurers have to do the talking through their transactions, and sometimes they can't, right? This is good, but it really sidesteps a whole bunch of really important issues that this paper brings to fore. In particular, even at the same maturities, we don't see all securities trading at the same price. That's it. If you ever try to fit a yield curve, this is exactly why you need a fitted smooth to the yield curve. Okay? Right? You know, prices of nearby securities aren't as close as they are supposed to be. So somehow, these are differentially priced. And that has major implications for the workings of the repo market. This is what this paper tackles head on and says, you know, what happens in the bond market and what happens in the repo market has to be related because it's the same security is being traded. In particular, we shouldn't be thinking of a separate kind of risk pricing in the bond market and a separate kind of risk pricing in the repo market because the marginal trader is the same person, is the other treasurer. Okay. So effectively, this paper goes to number three and says, they call it the upward sloping supply curve. I'm going to call it the downward sloping demand curve, right? It creates this opportunity for pricing of quantities. Very good. So a synopsis of the paper that does injustice, but is clear because it's not easy reading again, is you think of a Vianos Villa you know, preferred habitat world, but the habitats aren't given by maturities, rather by securities, okay? The moment you do that, you're now able to distinguish, you know, security one from security two, regardless of whether they have the same maturity or not. A question not answered here is, why would you do that? And I think that's a really important question going forward. That is, you know, what is it about this security that everybody wants this? Okay? I actually, in general, don't know it. We understand the answer is liquidity, of course. But that liquidity is endogenous. It's not that, you know, this is more liquid because everybody wants it, right? It, liquidity is an equilibrium object, right? So once people coordinate on a particular security, it becomes more liquid. But this paper doesn't ask the question, why this security? Okay? It just says there's specialness. Some of these securities, right, go, you know, people say, okay, we're going to do a collateralized transaction, just give me something, right? That's general collateral. But every now and then they go, no, no, I want this security. Now, the paper takes as a um, fundamental that such securities exist. It doesn't answer the question why these securities are that way. That's an important question, right? But it does then relate the bond market behavior to the repo market specialness. That's the term. Okay. Specialness is, has a very clear measure. You fit a yield curve and you look at how far away from its predicted yield based on essential general collateral stuff a particular security is. The farther away it is, the more special it is. Right? Good. Now, <clears throat> what this paper in a policy relevant way you know, goes, through the, goes through the juggler is to say QE is a machinery that itself generates specialness because the central bank comes in and buys some securities. The fact that it's picking those securities makes them special. And that's a problem, because what you wanted to do was to flatten the yield curve, not to move some securities away from that yield curve. Okay? That's the idea. Notice that this is a separate issue from the downward sloping demand curve. The downward sloping demand curve is, if you are going in as the central bank and buying a whole bunch of a particular security, will you have any price effect to begin with? Because under consumption cap M, you shouldn't. The next issue is, imagine that you do. Are you doing anything other than breaking the link between this security and the overall bond market? Okay? That's what this paper is about. And that's why it's so important. Now, here is a fitted yield curve 
with particular securities, what you can see here is that this is a yield curve that is fit on a you know, well-functioning market day to general collateral stuff. Nonetheless, the 10-year always trades away from the yield curve. So the 10-year segment, not only the on-the-run 10-year, not only the first off-the-run 10-year, the 10-year segment of the yield curve is always repo special, it's always away from the yield curve. Okay? So that's something that we actually need to understand. But one of the issues here is just collateral, uh, you know, comparing general collateral to special securities doesn't give you a good enough measure of specialness because sometimes the entire general collateral is special enough. What one should do is to ask, compared to the swap curve, how do these trade? Okay? Because whenever you're looking at treasuries, you're always thinking about liquidity pricing. Right? To buy the treasury, you have to put up the money, and that creates liquidity pricing. It's also the case that sometimes this thing is all over the place. So what you can see here is, you know, um, before the global financial crisis, the yield curve looked very nice and smooth. The circles are 10-year um, and similar issues. The diamonds are originally 30-year issues, the long-term stuff that the pension funds buy and hold. Okay? Now, these have different holders, and they may trade differently, but because of arbitrage, you see that you know, they are at the same prices until Lehman happens. The moment Lehman hits, our treasurers go, we don't know what else is going on, we don't want anything to do with this, and then you end up with two separate yield curves. Okay? That's specialness, and that's a big time specialness. And it's this kind of stuff that this paper is you know, well situated to think about. Now, what happens? OK, I told you this already. Here's something really nifty. Um, in 2012, there's the date, June 7th, Sweden said, with interest rates this low, our pension funds have liabilities that are insanely long duration. And to do duration matching, they have to hold an you know, inane amount of long-term securities, which is not good for them, not good for the market, not good for anything. Okay? So out of nowhere, the regulator came out and said, we're going to let the pension funds use an off-market higher interest rate to do duration calculation for their liabilities. Effectively saying, okay, you know, overnight, suddenly you have lower duration. Okay? What happened? All of these pension funds said, okay, we no longer need these long-term securities on the asset side. Now, consumption capacity is going to say, and nothing happens. Okay? That is the single largest movement in the yield curve, long-term yields of the Swedish yield curve in history. Okay? So that's what this paper says. This actually happens. We're going to take that as given. The fact that those securities are these particular securities, somebody is buying and selling them, it does make a difference. Okay? So that's very good. Now, let me, blah, 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 yeah, liquidity, good. Now, the issue that I'd like to bring to four, you know, to four is that this is a finance paper on a macro finance question. And I wouldn't want them to change this paper, but going forward, I think one of the more important things is to ask, what does this look like in a macro framework? Okay. So if you actually had a utility function somewhere, if you actually had a policymaker somewhere, there was a Taylor rule governing the risk-free general collateral rate, would we actually have all of these things in a model consistent way? Or would we suddenly go back to the world of consumption capem where all of these results would die? Okay. That's not an easy thing to do, but this is not an easy paper to write either. So if they were able to do this, um, I'm hopeful that they're going to tackle the other question too. Now, the bit here that I'd like to whine a little bit about, because it's not a discussion if you don't whine about anything, is the following. I think the paper correctly notes that by doing QE on particular securities, you're going to create specialness. This I agree with. That specialness is going to work against your QE. That I'm going to agree with too. Their policy recommendation is have a securities lending facility, which several central banks, including the Fed, does have. And that's a good way of doing things. That I'm not entirely sure. And this is something that I may not correct, have understood correctly. But here's my issue. Think of what QE is. Secu Long-term securities go from the market 
to the central bank. Money goes from the central bank to the market. Now think about the securities lending facility. What happens? The same securities go from the central bank to the market. Money goes from the market to the central bank. OK, that's going to offset the specialness by offsetting the QE. So it's not very obvious to me that this way of dealing with the specialness problem is the desired way of doing so. What is very clear, and this is a very obvious policy implication of this paper, is that if you're going to do QE, do a broad-based QE. Don't pick too few securities, because you're going to pull them away from the curve and make the arbitrageur's life difficult. And when their life dif is difficult, their risk pricing is going to be worse. And there isn't a separate risk pricing for specials and a different one for general collateral. It's the same risk pricing. And thus, you're going to be working against yourself. Now, you might ask, you know, who would ever do targeted QE? And the answer is Australia. There is a lovely paper by David Luca and Jonathan Wright, forthcoming in the Journal of Finance, that observes Australia announced a particular QCIP, one particular security that they said, we're going to fix the price of this security. That's how we're going to implement QE. Okay? Among other things, what happens is you, know, you can see that security out of the yield curve there. Okay? What you do is you create specialness and more or less nothing else. This paper is the theoretical foundation of why that happens and why that's bad. Okay? So it tells you that go for the broad-based QE so that you're moving the general collateral curve rather than creating specialness. Okay. Very good, very good, very good. So, yeah, I'd like to encourage the uh, authors. This paper had more repo market language than I'd seen in a long time, which I admired. Um, one term that wasn't there was repo fails. A repo fail is a repo contract is a collateralized lending when the borrower, the party who received the money, is willing to pay it back with interest, but the lender, the party who received the collateral, is unable to deliver the collateral. That's a repo fail. That's a big issue in the repo market. And in general, once it fails, it turns into a chain of repo fails because it's the same security that has been rehypothecated. Okay? This is a good framework to think about that. Not in this paper. It's convoluted and deep enough already. But as a next step, it would be great to have you think about you know, how does the specialness um, interact with repo fails. So let me conclude. Um, again, not out of courtesy or uh, tradition dictating it, let me say that this really is a wonderful paper, and you really should think about this. It's a very well thought paper. It's actually, the presentation wasn't the easiest to follow, neither is the paper. But given the subtlety of the question and the difficulty of joint modeling of the repo market and the bond market, I think this is the cleanest way of doing it. So you really should take a look at this, because next time your policymakers are asking you questions about QE, QT, how it should be implemented, what it is working, why it is working, this is a great framework to think about those. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, Rogero, would you like to, would you like to answer? The, the oh, of course. Um, I would like to thank you for the outstanding discussion. It was really a pleasure. Um, thank you very much. It was like, a, you know, so first of all, um, it clarifies the breadth of the discussion and, and the, the perspective that is coming from many, many years of uh, experience with the yield curve. So I thank you for your valuable, uh, we thank you for your valuable comments. Uh, let me quickly address a couple of them, uh, you know, just uh, uh, really briefly. Um, so one question that the paper does not uh, directly target is, uh, well, of course, uh, why does uh, uh, specialness arise at, at, at first place? So um, liquidity, in principle, could be used to, to mi microfound preferences for specialness. Uh, of course, uh, another possibility would be um, quantitative easing. So, uh, Central bank, we, we know actually, central banks uh, actually do create uh, specialness. Uh, but uh, I, I totally agree. Uh, I mean, you are right. We, it's, it's something that we don't do explicitly in, in the paper, but uh, uh, it would be interesting to, uh, to discuss. Uh, particularly, one thing uh, that uh, our segmented markets uh, enable us to do is to uh, 
um, have a pure pricing of uh, uh, interest rate risk that goes a little bit in the direction of uh, uh, pricing uh, with uh, the interest rate uh, swap curve. Uh, which uh, uh, I hope we will be able to do a little bit more about uh, in, in the future. And uh, I thank you for uh, this and other uh, valuable comments. Uh, particularly, it would be very interesting to incorporate uh, a Taylor rule, um, uh, which, uh, I mean, I think it's a question to the entire term structure literature, so that I'm not sure, you know, I, we would love to uh, address entirely in the scope of, of, of the paper, but uh, uh, one quick way of incorporating this is uh, uh, through the uh, long run mean of the process for, for the short rate that could be influenced by the central bank. Uh, but uh, I, I think this requires a more serious, uh, a more serious undertaking. Um, with respect to uh, repo fails and uh, rehypothecation, um, I think uh, that uh, in practice, re hypothecation uh, it's uh, it's less than uh, perfect, so it's uh, it's less than one. And to to this extent, uh, our findings uh, continue to work uh, with re hypothecation We haven't really considered the uh, repo fails, so uh, it's an interesting extension of our paper for which uh, I'm, you know I'm really grateful for uh, pushing us in this direction. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I think uh, it was like a great discussion. So let me just uh, thank the discussant for, and uh, yeah, thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have now time for a few questions. Uh, so uh, as before, we'd like to ask you to stand up, to, uh, say your name and your affiliation. I can ask a question. Uh, I will not stand up. Ralph Martin, Southside <laughs> Reserve Bank of Chicago. So I actually want to reiterate, Refat on the very end stole the point about the repo fails. I wanted to ask about this anyway. But so historically, repo fails happen big time when somebody managed to corner the market on one specific security, right? And that's kind of what made it special. You were asking where specialness is coming from, and that's like one way to think about it, that somebody figured out that there's too much short positions out there, cornered the market, forced the fail, made a ton of money. Um, the one question, of course, is we, we had various repo market reforms to what extent that has mitigated it. And then, of course, now what we perhaps care about is how would this interact with the standing repo facility that the Fed now has? Will this mitigate the issue? Is it sufficient to mitigate the issue or not? The, again, next paper, perhaps together with, with repo fails more generally and what a facility would look like that a central bank would have and how that relates to what we currently have built up. That would be very interesting to explore in the future. Well, we'd like to thank you. I think it was a great paper. It's, it's, very, it's very dense, and I think Thanks it takes a, a very long time really, to, to read. Uh, in particular, we would like to thank uh, Refet. I know that you are leaving now, so uh, thank you.